Um, okay, so I think the topic is 3DB and chain map storage. Is this correct? Yes. Okay. So, um, so um, um, to start, um, oh well, I think I. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so chain map storage is actually a different package that it's not is not within um, the chain map package. So we have this package chain web storage which is um it's not on hackage i think there's no reason why we shouldn't put it there maybe eventually or we can probably do it um and then we have 3db db which is a class type class in um the chamber package or project. So, and um, okay, what is in there? So 3DB is, and this is a story that I have, I think start every time with um, first version of chain web was this idea we implement everything for a single chain and then break things together. So 3DB is another example um, where we make design decisions based on that because um, the idea is that a blockchain or the, the, the data storage, or a blockchain generally is a tree. So if you have a single chain, you have somewhere a Genesis block, and then miners start mining on top of it. Sometimes you get often, so two miners mine in parallel a block. They start kind of small fork, but then the, at some point, one fork gets longer, and you know there's a reorg going on, and miners always go to the and um, agree on the longest fork, and this is what we then call um, the the actual winning chain or the winning branch, but um, what is in the store at any time um, or what actually is, is the miners work on or what they produce is a tree. Um, these parts of the tree, of course, um, get pruned because in the end, we only care about the winning branch, but well, it could happen, let's say, let's say there's a network partition and those things actually happen. Let's say, you know, some um, transcontinental internet cable got cut off or let's say some data center from from amazon goes offline essentially to the outside world but internally keeps working which really those things really happen um or let's say just for a big mining pool they the internet connection goes down but um at least there's a connection to the um or for a farm so their connection to the outside world but internally they keep working so it, it might be that there are really long branches produced in parallel and um and then when the connection comes back, they have to kind of um, find out what is the longest branch and synchronize again. In this case, for example, one miner or one, one node would kind of have to do this real kind of rewind, throw away everything from this point. So they would find the branching point and then kind of replace this branch. So that, that's the reason why the whole thing is a tree. And we also have to keep it. We can't throw it away too early because if let's say we, 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 at some point we might not know what is a winning branch. So we, we keep this tree structure for a while. And what is currently implemented is we, we prune it only on restart. So, and so that is the motivation why, why we, we, we say that block headers are stored as a tree and we call it TreeDB. And now we, needed, um, we need some queries on this tree and um, so we have an API. Um, GDB is a type class that gives us essentially an API to create and query these trees. There's something, the API, we can look in it later, but there are things like, well, how you query a tree, you want to usually be able to query the root of the tree, which is there's always a single root, which is a genesis block. There can only be one. So therefore it's a tree. Um, and th that's one thing you want to query. You might want to query also um, all entries um, up to a certain height, which would be something like, in this case, this, and you would get everything. And note that you get possibly two blocks at the same height, in this case. And you might also want to query, let's say, the longest, the ma maximum entry here. So we, and, and we have queries all of this. There's kind of, you can query the root, you can query the maximum entry. Um, you can, and then, yeah, so in a tree, essentially, you can, you have, you have two kinds of queries. One are forward queries um, that 
query from here and go up the tree. And then we have queries that go backward. And um, that, that, that caused some confusion in the past um, because the tree is stored. Um, every node knows essentially its parent. So actually, this is what, what is stored in the tree. Essentially, yeah, every block header has this parent header field. So there's a parent relation. And every block has a single parent. This means if you do a traversal that starts with one parent, some, somewhere, uh, some block somewhere here, and you go down, what you get is you get a single branch. What you get is always linear. It's not a, well, it's a degenerated tree, but it's really a line. But on the other hand, if you go forward, um, well, first of all, it's not necessarily efficient. Well, it is actually efficient how we implemented it. But um, so you, you would go to the children of the blocks. In this case, these would be two, and there's really no way to tell which one you want. So we return them all. This means if you do any of these forward queries, um, these entry queries, um, uh, entries it's called, um, entries queries, they, they, they return a tree, which means you get more than a single, possibly more than a single block at a block height. You get essentially all the branches. And um, so what we guarantee you in these queries is that they come in an order um so if you get them and you would kind of reconstruct a tree from it we would guarantee you that that that, that you can do it that they come ordered so that when you get um when we uh, well, what means ordered? it means when, when when we return your block hash this we guarantee that we returned all of its parents before we guarantee uh, before we return a block well of course within the, the, the range that you query so let's say you query from block height one to this would be zero one two three you query from one to three what would you get you would get the block one then you would get all blocks on on level two then you would get all blocks on level three be these and that's it so and we would guarantee you that when we give you for example this block at level three or one of these that we we gave you all blocks on the previous levels. But still, we, we can't tell you what is the winning branch here. So you, you would have to figure out yourself. Um, th those are the queries that go start at the, at the root or anywhere here and go up. And, um, and then we have the other queries that we call branch queries. For those queries, you have to tell us where to start. Um, that can be a set of blocks. You can say, for example, I want to start with this and with this block. So you, we, we say, give us an upper bound where you want to start. And then we, we follow the parent relation. If you give us just one, one, one block, let's say you want to just get the winning branch, then you give us, you first have to figure out what is the current maximum entry. Usually um, in practice, you don't query for the max entry here, max rank we call it, um, but you query through the cut because the longest thing in this king is not necessarily the longest cut. Um, most of the time it is, but generally it isn't. So at some point you need to find out what is your starting point. It's, it's usually not the max rank, but it's kind of what is in some cut you're currently looking at. So, but you give it and then we give you all the ancestors. Kind of in this case, you get really just one block per, per block height. Um, or if you start here, we would get, give you this line. And then these queries are pretty complicated because um, we, we turn the REST API, so you have kind of the ability to do pay. Uh, so there's paging in there. You can say, give me everything starting from somewhere up to this many blocks, and then you get a cursor successor, and uh, that makes it a little nasty. But um, and um, oh yeah, one for the uh, branch query. There's one one interesting thing. For example, if you want to find the fork point um, from two branches in the network, um, what you can do is you can do a branch query starting with two branches and, 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 and say only go to this point here. So how you do it, you provide, let's say you're interested in this branch here. And then you say, use this as an upper bound for my query, which means start here with this branch. And, um, and then you say, I want this as a lower bound. And, um, and the API has entries for it, upper bound, lower bound. And what it means, we start, we give you everything that is apparent from the upper bound. And, um, well, yeah, we, we give you all parents from the upper bound that are not children 
or uh, 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 sorry, that are not parents of the lower bound. So essentially, how it's implemented is we start with both, kind of we, we let's say we start, um, what are the levels here? This, this. So we, we, we would start with a traversal on both points here, then we go down. So first of all, we start here on this level, three, let's put numbers here, four, five, six, seven. So on seven, we only have one on this branch. So we start with this. Then we go to, then we go to um, six, and here we see we have two. So we, we, we also start traversing this lower bound branch. So this is upper bound. This is our lower bound. And so we, 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 we go on. So we return only from this, from the upper bound, but we keep track of these. So now we go here, go here, we go here. And what happens here is that we find a block that, well, we still include this because this is um, a parent from the upper bound or an ancestor. It's also an ancestor of the lower bound, uh, and it's also an ancestor of the lower bound. So this is a stop point. So actually, there are two kinds of queries. There's one kind of query that still includes this. There's another one that wouldn't include this. But it would be easy to get here, and then it just takes a parent. So this way, it's, for, for example, a way how you can find a fork point. Um, and, and this also works with not just a single upper bound, a single lower bound. You can provide a whole bunch of upper bounds. So you could have, say, several. You could do this, this, and this, and have as lower bound this one which would mean, for example, this one we wouldn't return at all. Oh, no, we would return. We would stop here. Sorry. Um, so yeah, so this is these are the two kinds of queries. And then the, the actually, the API has a few more variations of it. And if you, on the REST API, if you go into the, uh, 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 the type class, and then there are a few helper functions around it. But that's a rough overview of how the TreeDB works. Um, one problem with it is it's kind of overkill. Um, when we designed the whole thing, we were thinking a lot about arbitrary trees. Um, and we were very concerned about forks in the network, how to resolve forks and try. Well, in practice, um, we figured out that we anyways are not good or probably no blockchain, I guess, is our handling of really big, long forks just because validation when you traverse these trees really get expensive. And um, so you can't not traverse them that quickly because you have to validate all packed stuff along the way, which is really expensive. So um, it's a little overkill, probably. Um, although over the time, we kind of change this a bit and we optimize the whole implementation, not for this arbitrary scenario. So the API is the same, but what we actually implement uh, or have implemented by now is something that is optimized for something that we call a palm tree, essentially. It's a tree that is very degenerated. It's a long linear tree that has just a few branches on top. So usually we assume that a, that a blockchain looks something like this. Maybe, maybe there's a little bit of branching going on here. But essentially, there's this very long trunk, and then there's a little bit up here. And these branches are all very short. Um, that's what um, our implementation optimi is optimized for, and that works actually quite well. So there might be, by the way, where every time you restart a node, well, you can turn it off or on, but by default, it's on the, we actually prune this. So if this goes on here, and next time we restart, we would kind of remove these. Um, but even if you don't do it, so you might have a few small, short, I mean, if you leave them here, but these are all very short. So we assume that all branches here are under normal conditions short, and, and that helps us to implement things efficiently. In particular, there's, um, we had bugs in the past um, from that because we missed some places where we should have optimized. There's one very important optimization in here is when you say that you want, and, and that's something we need often, um, we have the longest branch or the one that is represented in the winning cut, let's say it's this one, and we're interested in this. And we now want an ancestor of that on the winning branch. So let's say you want to add a certain block height. For example, when we when nodes do catch up, they say, give me an ancestor from the current winning cut, but only up to a block height of, um, and this goes in steps of 1,000. Let's say we are here at 100. Let's say that's 100. So a node would say, give me something that is an ancestor of the winning cut, but at most has block, uh, has block height at, at most 100. So how would we find it? So um, 
we we the way how it's stored is that we can actually it's indexed by block height so internally the, the key for this is look something like um block height and hash so we can and and then we have also we have two indices for that we have also index just by the hash we can talk about later when we look at the code how how these indices are implemented but um but yeah usually we, we this is the main index by block height so the primary one so we we can look up at the block height but in this case you see we have more than one block on the side so how how do we know which one to return so the obvious way of doing this would be start here and just traverse the tree all the way down until you until you find this block which would be linear would be an algorithm linear in the size of the of the tree and um, actually during a catch up you make many of these queries so catch up would become quadratic in the size of the tree. And yeah, we actually had issues with that in the past. So before we optimize that. Um, so what, what, what we do instead is, um, and uh, well, yeah, what we do instead is we just assume that um, our blockchain looks like a palm tree. So that we assume that, let's say there are more branches here. We assume that all branches are very short. So what we do instead is we just look up all the block headers at a given height at 100 so we get three of them we say these are our candidates but we don't know which one is the correct one so what we do is um, we look up one block header above in this case we would look up this one and um, well in, actually in this case it's pretty obvious um, actually, this one doesn't matter we would we would look on the uh, we would look no it, yeah we would look up at this height we would get two headers and then we would follow these headers along the parent relation and then we would immediately see that we end up with just one candidate. And um, th that way we know it has to be this one. If this wouldn't work, so let's say this wouldn't resolve to just one, but still to several, which could happen. So if we had, for example, something like this, we would get two candidates now. So we would have this one we could cross out. We would still have two. Well, then we would go further ahead. So we would, instead of going one step up, we would get two steps up. And next we'll get four, then we would get eight steps up, 16, until we, we get close to, to kind of the length of the chain. In that case, we would just do the worst case um, algorithm, just traverse everything from, from the parent. Um, I think there's one more optimization in there that I just forgot. There's three, so if you look at the algorithm, um, people got confused by looking at the code. It's essentially three stages. So we have kind of an and fast optimistic variants then we have kind of a middle variant which i don't exactly know what what's the corner case where that we exploit there and then we have kind of the slow variant which is the pessimistic variants that usually never happens and that's how we implement these queries efficiently um, when you query something at a given block height we, we do this um, i think internally the function is called seek ancestor so it's yeah the, the, the implementation is a little tricky because it's a type class and some things are implemented on the specialized version, kind of the block header DB, and some are implemented in the type class, and, and has to be careful to not mess it up. But that's the overall idea of TreeDB. Um, there, I wonder if there are any other optimization in there. But I think that's the main optimi optimization that we currently have. There, are other, there would be other ways of doing it. If we ever get in a situation where this algorithm or this heuristics doesn't work for us anymore, we have other options we could do it. We could just hard code checkpoints along the track. Um, the other thing is um, something that we considered implementing in the beginning. We never did it because this thing worked just quite fine. Um, another alternative to get an efficient lookup um, along a parent would be a skip list. Um, essentially, you would implement another index on top of it with every entry you would kind of have shortcuts here going to ancestors that are further ahead let's say this thing would have a shortcut uh, to an ancestor 100 steps down so they would all have it and then then you have kind of some of these shortcuts would be of different lengths so you would kind of you get essentially an overlay tree here um that's something if you find ever that this algorithm doesn't work well we could switch to a skip list skip list implementation or something similar but right now it doesn't seem needed um okay so 
think that's the main thing I should say about 3DB. One more thing to note is, yeah, we first implemented a single chain. It's well possible that if we had implemented chain, would implement chain web right now, that we would throw this out and would directly implement a DAG, kind of a directed acyclic graph, because um, of course we have now with many chains, we have more than one of these trees. And they are braided together. So we have a second tree here for another chain. And um, they have the parent relation, but they also have the adjacent parent relation. So essentially, they are connected somewhere here. Um, so the whole thing is a DAG. But I'm not sure. It, we would have to see. There might be certain things that might pay off implementation-wise. Um, particularly in the code, we currently have a little bit kind of these 3DBs are initialized independently. But, um, but um, even if you do it, we should be aware that even though the deck, it's not an arbitrary deck. This braiding structure is hard coded and fixed. And um, so it's very, th there's really no point in. Yeah, I'm not sure. So it's, it, it might, so, so far, we, I, I don't it, would have to think about it, but it's not clear if there would be a benefit because this braiding structure between the chains is. Um, we have very strong invariance of it. So even though one might think it's, hey, this is an, an, an acyclic directed graph that you have there, it's not clear if it's, there would be a benefit of storing it, um, of storing it explicitly as a DAG and use um, specialized query algorithms there. So that's something just in case we want to re-implement something there, something to consider. Um, but yeah, generally, chain web is not a tree, but it's essentially, yeah, a DAG. Um, or actually, it's a product of trees, but OK. Um, so if you are interested, we can dive deeper into the implementation of this, how we kind of index things. But I think it might be better first jump to st chain web storage, because this is how how we store this actually on disk. And um, maybe then we can decide after that if we want to look into some code more closely. Yeah, that sounds good. OK. So OK. So oh, maybe before we jump into chain with store. So this is the store where we store the block headers. This is, and you, normally, this is what kind of the, it's like the, the, the backbone or the spine of a blockchain, the block headers. This is where everything gets linked together. Um, of course, we have we store more things. Not only this 3db is not the only thing. So we have also the cut db, which, as I mentioned, currently is essentially yes, cut db, um, which we really, in most situations, we really care only about the latest cut and nothing else. So usually we only it's a, think of it as a single database. We store some, some kind of history here, but we rarely look them up. So think of so what we store is we, we store the latest cut. And usually the flow is you take the latest cut, this points somewhere to close to the top of the different 3DBs um, for each chain. It has kind of one entry stored, and which usually is the longest entry or very close to the longest entry. But you can't rely on pointing to the longest entry because someone might have a mind to block, but it's not in the but it, it's not necessarily in the, in, in the best cut. Um, so a cut might. You know, there might be one cut like this, and one cut might, might be like this, and one might be better than the other. One is better than the other, of course. Um, so yeah, so we have the cut DB. You start with the cut DB. You get from the cut DB where your entry point for, for example, a, qu a branch query in your 3DB is. Then you go from there, and then you go to the block header you're interested in. And let's say it's a parent of the current header, which we use during PACT, which is the context of PACT validation, usually. Um, well, no, uh, forget it, I just said. But uh, let's say we're interested in the parent header here. So of course, from there, then you want things like the payload, which is not stored here. The payload is stored elsewhere. There's only the payload hash in here. And using the payload hash, you can go to the payload database. And But the payload database is, is um, yeah, that's another type class that we have here. Maybe I should talk about it quickly before we look into, because we store them all in the same place. So. Um, we have the, the cut DB is easy. That's really just the current cut. The payload for every block header, we store the payload in the payload database, and that's um, that's a rather unstructured storage. It's, that's just a key value store. And in the code, you see a lot this 
acronym CAS, which stands for Content Addressed Storage. Um, there might be a few places in the code also where, or in, in, in Haskell APIs, where CAS, CAS means um, compare and swap. Um, it's, yeah, unfortunately, those acronyms often occur in the same context. But in this case, it means comp uh, Content Addressed Storage. What it means is that um, the key for any payload um, um, so it's a key value store where the key can be derived from the content. So there's an um, 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 so there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an identity between the key and the payload. So if you have the payload, there's only one possible key for it. So if you know the key, the payload is determined uniquely. The only thing is you might not be able to discover to, to, you might not have the payload um, because you can't derive it from the hash. But um, there's really only one possible payload. Um, content address storage have very nice properties. For, for example, you could ease, there would be really no, no risk in storing the whole chain web database in a public cloud storage and use it from there, even give right access to everyone. Because the, the, the whole point is if you know the key, you, 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 know, you get the payload for it, you can check that the payload is correct. If the hash matches, you know you have the right payload so no one it's a bit like a, like git works or github works you know so you if, 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 if no no one can really change history so and it's also it's very nice it gives you strong consistency guarantee if, if something goes corrupted on disk um another nice thing is that um, an api doesn't need an update function updates are always nasty so um our cast api there's a class for it test only a function insert. Actually, no, it doesn't have an insert. <laughs> there is, um, oh no, it has, there's two casts. We have a read only cast, which doesn't have an insert. And um, it only has a query lookup key. There's a lookup. Well, and essentially that's it. Um, and there's, an, there's a read only cast. And if you have kind of a general class that has an insert method, which just takes it's only a value, it doesn't need the key because the, the key is derived from the value. So if you give it a value, a payload, you can compute the key from it. Um, look up key. And um, I'm not sure if you have a delete. Our cars, we never need to delete. I think there's a delete in here. You can delete a key, um, but um, we barely use it. it. It would be only for garbage collection. Um, but the nice thing is, you see, there's no no notion of an update because if you you, you just do an insert and um, the, the insert is always idempotent, so there you, there's only one possible way to store a value. It's, it's value is available or it's not available, but it can't change. There's no way to change a value. Okay, so th this is the and this is how we store payloads. And by the way, um, even though this tree DB is internally stored in a cards, is it? I should no, it's not. I'm sorry. I, I should be careful. There. Um, but yeah, this is how we store payloads and we store all, all kinds of other things. And actually, the, yeah. So, um, let's get to the payload later if you have time, because the payload is not stored individually. So we have a whole kind of index structure here. And the reason why we have it is um, that we want to allow to verify Merkle hashes and verify as as SPB proofs and allow lightweight nodes that don't necessarily have to validate um, packed or uh, yeah execute packed code. So we we designed the whole payload storage in a way um, that you can validate things without having to run packed and um, because that's potentially expensive. So we yeah, uh, but but so there's a whole tree of the storages internally. So we take things apart and. Um, but we, if you have time, we can look into that later. One note is only if you ever have to do code change, changes on chainweb.payload and anything below that, um, yeah, make sure you get a thorough review because it's very easy to mess up things in there. There, um, we, we, we had long meetings where we designed that and not everything is obvious in there. So e even some stuff might be outdated and it might, if you would redesign it, we might be able to simplify a lot of stuff, but 
not every simplification that looks obvious um, one would get right. So I would be very careful before I make any change there. I'd rather keep it over over engineered or overly complex than kind of breaking something because I don't remember why we did certain things in a certain way. So ju just yeah, if you make any change to payload to storage, um, get get good reviews or schedule a meeting. Um, it also has the potential to break the chain um, and cause faults. Okay, um, chain web storage. This is essentially where we implement the storage backend stuff for it. It's a relatively small package. And what is in there is um, it defines this cast type class. So it has this, I think, we can look at the code. A minute. So there's this read only cast, which essentially allows us to give you a view of our backend storage without the ability to change it, which just means um, you can't mess things up. Um, and we restrict kind of give write access only for the modules that need it. Then we have the more powerful cast, um, which is a superset of this. Um, from the functionality. Um, what else is in there? There is an implementation for, um, and then there are implementations of cars. There's, for example, in trivial cars implementation that trivial, which I think is empty. Whatever you ask it, it always, the lookup is, oh, you can insert stuff, but you can never look them up. Um, or, well, if you get always nothing back, I think if I remember correctly. There's, um, there's, an, an, that's sometimes useful. Um, there is kind of in memory something that is based on a hash map that we use during testing. Um, also, it was our original implementation. That's the reason, by the way, why we have this cast type index everywhere in our code, which probably is quite nasty. But the main idea is to be able to abstract about the implementation. In particular, for the payload stuff, we have many kind of different casts and we kind of have to propagate the type parameter everywhere. Um, it's something, if we if we ever decided that we don't need an abstraction, we only have a single storage backend, um, we, we could probably just drop that. I'm not sure if we, that, that, it might be useful to be able to, to have a pure in-memory implementation, which is this hash map cast. Um, and then there's the rocks DB cast, with, which is an implementation of this, um, Content address store based on um, RocksDB, and actually this um, this class is a little bit of a lie because there's not only a content address store in there, there's also a just key value store in there. So there there are two. It offers two APIs. It offers a key value API, which is called it's it's just a table, call it, and um, and then it offers also a cast version of it, which is content address. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's a little misleading because it's within this cast namespace. I think it's cast.rocksdb or something like this. And um, if, if you look for it, yeah, there's also an, just a plain key value store implementation in there. Um, maybe we should move it to a different module to make it easier to discover. Um, OK. Oh, and then there's some thing in there that um, we currently don't use, but we might use again. And it was very helpful in the past before we had the, the, the SQL light backend for packed working. For speed up testing, we had an intermediate implement storage backend for packed, which just serialized all the previous in memory um, storage to disk. And this was terribly big. And so we implemented something that's called a dedup store. But, and um, that might be something if you run in, in the future when we currently our databases are not that big. But if they get bigger, what this does is um, binary level deduplication. And um, it, it, I think it's a pretty neat um, storage system, um, which um, um, can reduce the, if you have a lot of duplication, for example, we have the coin, whatever coin code, or pack probably has a lot of stuff that occurs over and over again. This thing is is very good um, in in reducing this automatically. You can just plug it into any car. So um, 
it's completely transparent, but it will store things in a different way and deduplicate internally. Um, the only drawback is that you lose locality. If you need range queries or you have things optimized for things being close together, and RocksDB does it by default, so it has internal caches or so, if, as soon as you use this, you get kind of much smaller storage, but um, your performance might be worse because things are not stored closely together, but kind of are distributed randomly. And um, yeah, so these are the different storage backends that we have implemented there. And um, maybe one thing why we use RocksDB, um, um, RocksDB, um, so it's called DB. And most people, when they hear DB, they think about um, um, relational databases. First of all, this is not relational at all. It's had nothing to do with SQL databases or so. Um, it's also not, um, well, there, and then people often use kind of their SQL databases, their NoSQL databases like CouchDB or MongoDB. This is also not one of those. Um, so relational databases have all the things that say you can have joins and complex SQL queries. Um, these NoSQL databases have usually that you store documents and then kind of like JSON documents that have a tree structure and you can kind of query a pass in a document. Um, so it's also another high level thing. Uh, RocksDB is kind of a class of databases that call database, but they're really just database backends. This is kind of RocksDB, LevelDB, there are a number of other um, backends that are usually used to implement systems like um, um, relational database systems or um, NoSQL databases. And um, so it's a very low level thing. Um, it comes from LevelDB, which was the Google implementation, which uh, it was a Google implementation that was used by many other databases as backend. Um, RocksDB is a fork of it um, from that Facebook did that optimizes LevelDB for their use cases on um, low latency, relatively big servers, um, and um, particular low latency writes. And um, so it's maintained by Facebook. LevelDB is still maintained by Google. And the Haskell package um, from Has uh, RocksDB Haskell is also a fork of the LevelDB package. And um, unfortunately, it's not maintained anymore. That's, that's one reason why I'm not super happy with it. But it's used by other big projects. So we are not the only one using it. It serves the purpose, so it works for us. It has some known issues regarding um, asynchronous exceptions but so far we we can live with that um it's also not super critical for us and um so if something goes wrong we just restart um the um there is another version of it and, and it also implements a very small relatively old subset of the api many features are not available and um, there's another version of it that is also not maintained anymore, but is um, supposed to be, be new. And I think Cardano is version that, that's called RocksDB Haskell MG. We might consider switching to that one. I think both versions were done by FP Complete um, as a consultant project with from um, Cardano. And yeah, we might switch to, um, we might also at some point, not sure, have to implement our own or maintain it. But at this point, it, it's reliable. But um, but also another thing is um, we use only a very small set of features from RocksDB. And um, once we notice that it's not maintained anymore, we did this intentionally because it will allow, allow us, um, it would be relatively easy to swap out RocksDB for any other low level key value store. So the, the class of these low RocksDB, LevelDB, and as I said, there are several other um, systems. Um, is The focus is really just having a low level fast key value store that also um, um, for it's not distributed, it's on a single server. It gives relatively good atomicity uh, or um, 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 transactional properties. And um, they are fast. They are very good protecting you against um, um, crashes. So they make sure that they flush everything to disk, have um, um, <coughs> write ahead logs and um, things like this. Um, <coughs> so they focus on, on kind of having a robust backend on a single server. and um, so, but otherwise, they have very little features. Um, so it's um, yeah, it's mostly um, you have a key, you store it, 
And what they're good in is, um, and, and yeah, they give you range queries. So, and that's something that we exploit a lot. So you can, rel you can relatively cheap iterate over your data if you have kind of an ordered, if your set of keys has an order. And um, that's something that is important for us. So key value, range queries or ordered keys and, um, and keys can be, rel can be relatively long. So you can encode a lot of things into the keys. And um, yeah, that's that's essentially it. And um, so, in order to get to, so the we we need um, in our implementation, we have different tables in RocksDB. RocksDB doesn't have a notion of tables. They have a notion of um, um, column families. We don't use it because the Haskell API doesn't expose it, and we decided it might not better not to use them because by implement ourselves we can we, we don't get a vendor lock on rocksdb and um, the idea is is essentially if you need two tables or you have two sets of keys uh, uh, two types that you implement in rocksdb that you encode this in the key for example let's say we want to store our block headers there we might use as a key well you have to be very careful when you design your key spaces um, about orderings so we might do something like start with a fixed pre uh, uh, with a um, with a, a, a prefix like um, table name. Let's say block headers. Let's call it bh, and then you might have some separator character, and then we put. Uh, and I'm making that up right now because I don't know it out of my head. So we might put some block height here. So might put some block height. And then we might have another separator if we need it. Well, these are probably numbers. The hash is base64. Oh, well, no, we do it's binary, actually. It supports binary. Then we um then we might put the hash. And yeah, and that might be a key for a block header. And um, you see that um it's done in a way that they are sorted by block height, and this allows us to do range queries over when we, for example, query for a particular block height to get all the hashes at a given height. Um, if we have the payload, we might, for example, start with another prefix, let's say payload, and then just have the hash because we actually we, we put the height here. Um, I'm not sure if we expose it on the API, but internally we do it, and the reason is locality um, to make sure that we can access. Um, it's it just the way how how RocksDB stores things on disk, so it orders the keys. And stores things in a way, and it can can it, it works kind of since we usually work on on just the top range, kind of we want to have things in cache, memory cache, and RocksDB is very good in keeping stuff in in, in memory and cache. So we, we we use a high tier to improve cache um, performance, and then we might have the hash here, and. Um, and then we do things that we have, um, for example, for tests, since this creates a lot of stuff in the file system. When we want to create things quickly, you can, for example, we have this with test rocks DB. What it does, it puts something in front here so that you can have two tests running in parallel without kind of messing up with the tables using the same rocks DB. Um, oh, well, generally, one good thing about rocks DB is it's multi threaded, so you can, it's thread safe. So you can have several threads accessing it at the same time without, without needing the need to implement logs yourself or so. Um, the, yeah, and as I said, it gives you atomic rights and it, it, it's safe against crashes. Um, so it flushes things very quickly to disk. <clears throat> um, the, yeah, and, and one thing that's another thing, um, designing those keys is a little bit of a black art. Um, one has to be very careful there um, to make sure that, um, you know, what characters you allow. For example, if you use this as a separation character, we must make sure that we don't allow this character in here and we have to check that. And um, so designing those key spaces um, affects a lot of performance and also correctness if things you know well you can't do an attack in a sense you know those those data structures are generated by us it's nothing that it would be really bad if, if user data could in go, go could go anywhere in the key which is not the case um, but even for a programmer to mess something up here so it's yeah just 
uh, want to mention if you store something in Roxb, make sure that you that, that you get a Unix key prefix and um, and make sure that it doesn't overlap this and any other things that we store in there. Um, yeah, this much. Yeah, and yeah, one thing is, um, I think it might be good to to abstract this ta RocksDB table. It's I think called. It might be good to abstract that. It's something we have on our to do list since a long time to uh, to to define a type class around it so that we could easily implement other storage backends and don't get a vendor log there. Uh, or yeah, could experiment with other databases. So all we would have to do is um, put a type class around the table API, which more or less is just a key value store plus iterators. So everything when that can iterate over keys and do point queries. That's essentially all that we need. Oh, and we need forward and backward iteration currently with our yeah. We we need iteration in both directions. Um, yeah, I think that's that's the rough overview. Yeah, and I, is there anything else? No, I, I think, yeah, we can we can dive into the code if people say, oh, I want to see where the stuff is implemented, or want to see you know these type things, or we we can go through the queries and can look at the. Yeah, GDB let's look at some code. I think that'd be great. If people want to look at code, we can do that. OK, so where should we start? Should we look at 3DB, or should we look at the RocksDB table, or any preferences, or what is the most or the payload structure? Oh, wherever you think. We could do the same order that you just did, start with 3DB a little bit. OK. So it's implemented in Chainweb 3DB, I think. OK, so it's ChainWeb 3DB. Um, and so we have, yeah, we have some exceptions that um, that can happen when you work with it, like parent missing, key not found, invalid rank, OK? Um, yeah, the terminology there, it's a bit, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's, it's one of the first modules that we implemented on Chain for ChainWeb. So the terminology is a little old and maybe not what you expect so um there particularly it was implemented independent before we had a block header db so there's not very chain web terminology in there when we say a rank you see a min rank the rank refers to the block height essentially kind of the rank is kind of the level in the tree where you are and um then we have still this db entry which is um now always a block header so in the beginning we used it also for other stuff and um, but now it's always a 3db entry type is always a block header the key type the db key type family is always um is always the um, block hash um okay so what do we have let's maybe start with the class itself oh yeah so first of all we have a type class for an tree database entry which is um, which has an associated um, type which is a key type and then every entry in a, in, in, in a tree database needs to provide a function to give us a key so which means it's content addressed so you when you when you have an entry you must be able to derive the key from it for the block header DB that's a block hash Actually, is it a block hash? Yeah, it's a block hash, I think. Um, you, you have to be able to derive the rank from it, which is the block height, essentially. And, um, and there must be a parent relation. And, uh, and then there's an instance for it in, um, let's see, in source chain web, block header. So there should be an instance for this for block header. Let's say three db. Here's the instance. So for block headers, this looks like the key type is a block hash. The key itself is a block hash. The rank is a block height, and the parent is well. If it's a Genesis block header, the the, the parent is nothing, and 
otherwise it's um, the parent. One thing to be aware of, um, I, I wonder if we could, that might be something that we could refactor at some point and clean up a bit. Um, in, we, we deal with the, the genesis block, the parent of the genesis block, we deal in different ways. In some cases, we just return in some algorithms, we return the um, block header. It is it, the block header itself, essentially forming a small loop, which sometimes helps us to not have weird corner cases. And um, in other cases, we return nothing. So here it's nothing. But yeah, that's something to be aware of that it can be different. Um, okay, so let's go back. So then the tree DB itself is a type class that. Um, I'm not sure why we need typable here. Probably some reason, I don't know. Um, the um, old oh, typable might be needed for NF data instances, but I don't remember. Um, the, um, okay, what we require is, is that we have, um, oh, oh, well, the 3DB is just kind of has an associated type family, which is the entry type, and the entry type has to be an instance of 3DB entry. And then the API, well, there's a simple lookup, which um, just takes the key and returns you possibly an entry if, uh, entry if it exists. So that's straightforward. Um, and then there are queries for keys. And um, as I said, these queries that little have a long list of parameters there. I think they are, for most of them, they are simpler versions that, that put reasonable defaults for the parameters. Um, so when you query keys, and um, these are forward queries, it means they can re return you more than one entry for a given height. So, but there is this notion of a limit. The limit is essentially paging. So you say, give me, run the query, and return only at most um, 10 entries or something like this. Um, and the and then we have um, a min rank and a max rank. This means everything in the query should be between the uh, all result only give me results between these values, kind of that are larger than min rank and smaller than max rank. And oh, and the result is returned as a stream, which is kind of um, it's 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 essentially more efficient or a list list within a monad. Um, and um, the uh, oh, and the stream is we, we, it has to be returned here as a callback. It's essentially it's a bracket style because um, because of resource management. It has to do with how iterators are handled in allocated in RocksDB and possibly in other databases. So essentially, the stream has a um, connection to the and handle to the database and open handle to an iterator which is stateful and we must make sure that we deallocate it and we don't use it after it's deallocated so we we wrap the whole thing that's a little nasty but um it actually gives for sane efficient resource management so otherwise we would have to run the whole query and close the data store it in a buffer close the database which would not be very efficient for large queries so yeah so it gives you the stream Essentially, how it works is it's, it's, it's you, you, you make this query and then we find you all the keys within min rank and max rank. Then we apply the limit. And, um, and when, when you have a limit here and there are more entries that, let's say, our query would return 50 entries, but you query only for 10, we give you also um, in the limit, let's look at this type of this thing. So, um, oh no, when you query for limit, do, sorry, I, do we return a page? Oh no, here we don't do it. But um, um, when we, on the REST API, um, the stream is returned in form of pages and um, a page um, might have kind of a next entry here, which is essentially a cursor. And um, in the first parameter here, this next item is essentially if it's a continuation query, you can use it as a cursor. So we would start at this item. Or you can also just give it yourself. And yeah, it's essentially, and it can be inclusive or exclusive. Um, 
inclusive means it would start with this item exclusive would um uh, mean um that, that that's uh, that's the item that you give we would start only with the next item so but this is mostly motivated from for the rest api um, okay, so this is, and, and then there's the same kind of queries for entries. So this would only return you the keys, and this query returns you the entries. So essentially, you say start with the given cursor or some item um, or some block height uh, and or block block hash. Um, the limit says how many you want at most. Um, then you can give a min rank and a max rank, which just kind of applies essentially cuts your query kind of make sure all items returned are within that range and then you get a stream which might be empty if you kind of choose um, values you know if your next item and min rank and max rank are exclusive then you might not get anything okay so so those were these forward queries so you you might in this case you might get more than one item per block height um, and here we have this branch queries which are backward and um, again, this list of parameters is pretty nasty, but they are, as I said, they're simpler versions of this somewhere in the code where you don't have to provide all parameters with reason that just put reasonable defaults. Um, so here's the same thing. We have this next item. So if you, for example, query this over REST API and you've got one page and you want to get the next page, it will tell you what this next this cursor is. Um, it has a limit again. It has a min, min rank and max rank. So if you're only interested in a certain range, um, all of this can be nothing. Um, <clears throat> and then it has these lower bounds, <clears throat> which essentially tell you, and I think, let's see what, uh, yeah, so the predecessor of nodes in upper. So what it does, it returns all predecessors of nodes in the upper bound, and not pre, uh, which are not predecessors of any node in the lower bound. So essentially, the lower bound puts a lower limit. So, <clears throat> and, and that's very helpful to find branch points or just branch, branches. <clears throat> and okay, so there you can get all the keys on a certain branch. And um, all the entries here. And then there's... <clears throat> The query for the max entry, so the essentially the longest branch, and <clears throat> there's also a query for the the rank, so the height of the longest branch, and that's it. So that's the GDB interface, and then there are a number of um, uh, tools around it, so you can get the query for the root, you can query for min rank, and which is essentially the the, the height of the root. Um, and yeah, there's well, we can go. Through, I'm not sure if it makes sense to go through it, but um, there, there, many of these functions are just um, help us to implement new instances for GDB. So there, you would rarely use them directly, but you would use them um, when you want to implement. They, they can be helpful when you implement your own instance of a GDB. Um, maybe one thing I should show you is. Um, um, the yeah here here when you implement your own version you might use one of these default implementations but you should be careful um, and really carefully read the documentation because um, there are a lot of performance issues related to that if you pick the wrong default implementation you might get terrible performance um, the one interesting function here is chain branch entries okay get branch um, Let's see. Extreme. I'm looking for the um, example for. Um... Oh, by the way, one thing is um, functions that end with an M are usually returning the result. Um, doing error handling by throwing an exception. For example, in this case, um, it will. The, you, it, it uses row M kind of um, for Monat's row um, to return errors. If they don't have the M, then usually they do explicit error handling and return a maybe or so. So lookup itself returns maybe, but lookup M 
Will, why wouldn't um, you? Why wouldn't you have done those in Monad Catch? I'm just interested. Uh, oh, more, more, do these cost, require I/O? Oh, maybe they. Oh, no, they do. they're in I/O-ish, I guess. Yeah, they are in I/O. The M is really just to. I'm not a to, fan, by yeah. the way, of over polymorphism. So I'm just yeah. And actually, we used to, it used to be polymorphic. So we this I/O here was actually an M. And we had a long list of um, you know monad constraints on it, and yeah, at some yeah. point we we just yeah, removed it. Said, Let's go for I/O, but we kept the um, we just kept the convention to to add an M, because right. we still use the monad throw instance from um, from no, I/O. It, it looks like everything has I/O in it. I was thinking maybe. Yeah. These yeah. are pure things that you dropped into. I was just wrong. Never mind. Yeah, we, we could have used probably look up I.O. It's, it's, we, we use M, I think, everywhere in the code, code base as a convention to indicate that error handling is done via monad throw. I guess the, the stream thing, there's all these stream I.O. And what about stream wants to be a transformer over some monad? What does it need? Um, that you can you can do that. We used to have it. So no, no, is, right there. You can see it's stream yeah. blah io. What is the role of that third of that second term in stream? The second this Not, one? No, the that's the first term. term. Oh, this one. Second. Yeah. What is the role of that? That's a base monad. So stream itself is a monad, St and um, you could you could build a stream about the stream's a other. transformer. Yeah. It's free T, effectively. Yeah. Okay. It's a so control. I see. Okay. So, but there's nothing about stream that cares what that monad is. No, stream itself is um, it our streams, constraints on what that yeah. is. Our, our streams care because they run on top of a database, and it's. Oh and, really? Yeah. This is the reason why we use stream here. Um, that we can do efficient database queries. Essentially, the stream just wraps an iterator. Okay, so it doesn't have a requirement. We have a requirement that it be some I/O like thing because yeah. we want to back. This is polymorphic code to for something that could be backed by I/O operations. Yeah. Yes, um, but okay. we used to be the three DB itself doesn't care about I/O, and the first version of three DB was just using um, and, 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 and was generic in the mo or parametric in the in the monad. So you could, for example, we had an, hash for the, the hash map implementation wouldn't use I/O there. Um, you could run it on identity, um, but it was just in, you know it was essentially likely have one already exceptions. The Is there any alternative to I/O? Like real exceptions, not you know, except T, or except. Um, no, um, but yeah, no. Right. But if you if you want I/O exception, you need you need I/O. Um, but you, I'm you, saying you, exceptions. Yeah. Period. Right. Like if yeah. I want to throw, if I want something that can host throw M and have the same asymptotics as I/O exceptions, I have to run an I/O. Uh, you could use like monad error. Yeah. No, yes. except because there's all the problems with like accept and stuff like that. Like, oh, oh the performance wise. Yeah. You mean, I I don't know how 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 good I I know that MTL got much better. I don't know about the performance of accept. It might be that I don't know how much more efficient. Or it's how just much that you I think there's no it. cost to exceptions for some reason. Like, whereas like an accept is going to mean that you're branching your code. You know, because it's actually going to have to yeah. consider. Like GHC has to consider the fact that the code has these two branches, whereas with an exception, it doesn't really have to consider that. That was my understanding. Yeah, yeah well, that's true. There is some other stuff that has to go on behind the scenes. Like you do have to find a call stack and uh, like- Oh, of course. Update that. No, 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 no. That's when you throw the exception. But when you don't throw the exception- Oh, you just read it? Better. No, an IO. When IO doesn't, IO has to have instrumentation so that you can- all the cost gets paid when you throw the exception. Oh, okay. So I see what you're saying. Yeah. You but when you're not yeah. throwing exception, it blazes through because it doesn't have to consider because it's using a low level mechanism yeah. to essentially do the, you know, the uh yeah, branch prediction. Or yeah, to do the um there the is no graph at all, I think. What's yeah. that? 
I mean, the jump is happening via yes, interrupts right. or whatever the mechanism is. And yeah, exactly. whereas except so, you actually have, you know, code, you know, like those, those things are going to bottom out to left and right. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, it's, 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 it will um, will optimize for the one that it feels like it's going to see most in the call graph, which is usually going to be the right. Um, so it will optimize for the right. So you don't really get hit by branching and exceptions like this. I think, well, I'm not 100% sure. I think, I, well, one thing is I always really amazingly fast in, in GHC. And I, I, I really right. think- this is more about it's GHC. It's sure it's that it's, it, 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 I think I, the exception mechanism is, is is bound to essentially the scheduler. They, they, the code really right. doesn't have branches. So they have the things that they essentially are a little imprecise, but they it's built into the runtime essentially. Yeah. It's one of those things um, like I'd like to have just the exception part of IO and nothing else. Like, you know, like have a another monad that's only IO insofar as it does exceptions and then is pure otherwise. But you know, I want a pony too. You might be able to <laughs> 